Knowing how thick the metal is in your steel boat's hull is critical information for you and your insurer. On most steel boats, over time, the steel plate gets thinner due to wear, erosion, and of course, corrosion. Once the hull gets too thin, your insurer will decline cover and you're likely to be facing a repair bill running to thousands of pounds. That's why underwriters usually insist on a hull thickness survey every five to seven years. But the big question is, how thick does the hull actually need to be to be strong enough and insurable? The first way to think about this is to consider how thick the steel plate needs to be when the boat gets built. There are several methods for doing this, and in their excellent discussion paper, Minimum Steel Thicknesses for Narrowboats, published in 2022, in their waterway surveyors, Tom Keeling and Peter Brooks, ran through several commonly used calculations to suggest an acceptable minimum thickness for the industry. Depending on which method one uses, the minimum plate thickness needed to build a typical 50-foot narrowboat should be between 3.35 and 4.7 millimetres. Yet the modern industry average for new builds is 10 millimetres for the base, 6 for the sides and 4 for the top, commonly referred to as 1064. From that, it's clear that most narrowboats are seriously over-engineered. So why is that? One part of the reason is that when boat builders buy steel plate, the thickness is quoted as nominal thickness, which is not the same as actual thickness. Depending on the grade of steel used, this variation could mean getting a nominal 6 mm plate that's anywhere from 5.25 to 7.2 mm thick. So building in a little thickness safety margin at the build specification stage is common practice. If you find this analysis useful, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. It would also be fair to say that the majority of narrowboat bottom plates rarely get the care and maintenance that they deserve. Indeed, there are plenty of people on the cut who will say, you don't need to paint the bottom plate for one of several reasons. My favourites are, well, there's no oxygen down there, it won't corrode, or it'll only rub off, or perhaps with a little more honesty, we've never painted the bottom plate. Having surveyed narrowboats in many marinas and yards, my observation is that many of them simply cannot lift the hulls high enough or have dry docks deep enough to offer meaningful access to the bottom plate to survey them. Therefore, the same limitation also goes for pressure washing, blast cleaning and repainting the bottom plate. So for many yards, looking after the base plate falls into the too difficult category and over the years, the excuses have emerged to explain why they don't offer such services. Indeed, as I noted in a previous video, some chartered companies don't bother painting the bottom plates or fitting any old anodes either to minimise the whole life cost of their boats. If you're interested in boats and are enjoying my videos, you should check out my Boat Chat newsletter, which comes out every month. My mission is helping people understand boats better, and in the newsletter, I take a look at key maritime news stories and ask what they might mean for boat owners, brokers and surveyors. I also add in some boat maintenance advice, marine surveying tips, product reviews, and plenty of other boat-related stuff. There's a link to Boat Chat down in the description. So, given all of the above, how should we look at thickness loss with a view to insurability and making sensible repair decisions? There are two principal ways to consider thickness loss. The first is by having an absolute figure for minimum insurable thickness, such as 3, 3.5, or 4 millimeters. This figure could be universally accepted by insurance companies and marine surveyors. Now, this is a nice simple method to apply until we find the plate used at build was only three or four millimetres to start with, as was the case with many Springer narrowboats. So, does having a minimum figure mean that all lightly built inland waterways craft are therefore uninsurable? That would not be an ideal outcome for anyone. The second way we can assess thickness loss is by setting a maximum percentage that can be lost from the original plate thickness. It's worth taking a moment to explain what pit depth thickness means. It is simply the thickness of the steel remaining in the bottom of any pit. To illustrate a typical pit depth thickness measurement, here we are back at the 1993 60 foot spring and narrowboat we saw earlier. You can see the four meter station marking that I've circled in yellow. Meter stations are the distance from the bow of the vessel, which I refer to in my survey reports. I always write the number aft of the vertical line which shows where the mark is. That way, I can look at any picture and work out which side of the vessel the photo was taken on. Anyway, 
I found a pit on the keel plate that was worth measuring and there were plenty to choose from. I start by taking a thickness reading as close to the pit as possible and got a good reading of 4.8 millimeters. Then I get my Mitutoyo dial depth measurer and bridging across the pit as best as I can, measure the pit depth at 3.6 millimeters deep. Then it's just simple maths to work out that the steel thickness remaining in the pit is just 1.2 millimeters. It's not an exact measurement for several reasons, but it serves to show how the steel plate is faring. If we assume the plate was five millimeters thick to start with, a typical spec for a spring and narrow boat, that means over 75% of the steel's thickness has gone in 30 years. The hull needs remedial work done as soon as possible and in this condition is uninsurable. As a precautionary tale for anyone looking to buy a steel hulled boat, I took these readings during a pre-purchase survey and you will not be surprised to learn that I advised my client to walk away. The sad twist of the story though is that the state of the hull came as a rude shock to the seller who had only owned the boat for four years. He was rather embarrassed to admit that he bought the boat without a survey, having been assured that it was all in good order. He now faces a bill running into several thousand pounds to put it right, or having to drastically reduce the selling price, meaning he will make a significant loss. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. If you're looking to buy any steel boat, a pre-purchase survey with a comprehensive thickness survey is essential. Make sure you get it done somewhere where the yard can get the boat high enough off the ground for them to clean it and for your surveyor to be able to do their job properly. I hope that was useful for you. Now, let's get back to option two for considering thickness loss, the percentage lost method. For example, if we will not accept more than 30% thickness loss, then a six millimeter plate would be condemned when the pitting depth exceeds 1.8 mil, leaving 4.2 millimeters of steel thickness in the pits. But by that measure, so would a 10 mm plate with 3 mm pits that still had 7 mm of steel thickness left in the pits. But of course, we often don't know the actual steel thickness used when the hull was built due to the variation between nominal and actual thickness. This could render a huge number of hulls uninsurable while still having over, say, 4 mm of steel thickness remaining. As you can see, there are no easy answers to the how thick does the steel have to be question. And in many ways, for me, the conclusion is, it depends. It depends on not just the thickness of the steel specified at build, but also on the quality of that steel. There is a wide range of steel plate, and the price for quality steel plate approved by Lloyds, for example, is significantly higher than for run-of-the-mill plate. It also depends on how well the steel was prepared and painted at build, and how well that paint covering has been maintained. Finally, it depends on the types of corrosion active on the hull, and the time they are allowed to develop. The decision to condemn a hull must never be taken lightly and every surveyor needs to exercise caution when doing so. Many people live on their narrowboats and the financial and personal impact of such a decision should never be underestimated. The methodology used to make such a decision will inevitably vary from survey to survey due to the variety of factors present that influence that decision. It's therefore essential that the surveyor defines what their reasoning was in reaching their decision. For example, on a 65 foot 1064 narrowboat with extensive pitting along the hull sides at 30% or more of the original thickness, leaving 4mm or less in the pits, replating or overplating the side plate may be the best option. Were those same pits more isolated, then perhaps pad welding the deepest pits might be the better recommendation. Whilst general thickness loss to below 4mm on a 10mm bottom plate would certainly require remedial work, possibly replating or overplating, if that steel was only 5mm originally and is in generally good condition for its age, the better decision might be to abrasive clean the steel back to SA 2.5 and repaint it with quality 2-pack epoxy paints. The main point here is there are no easy answers here. The methodologies used need to be put into a specific context and the decision reached should reflect this. In their paper, Tom Keeling and Peter Brooks reached the conclusion that three millimeters is the best compromise for an industry-wide minimum residual thickness measurement. And for holes built to precise scantlings with four or three millimeter plate, then 25% should be the maximum permissible wastage. The three millimeter figure must be considered against other factors and the expertise and discretion of surveyors must remain paramount. 
As always, it must be stated that replating is always the preferred repair option to overplating, which, whilst far more common and convenient, should only ever be viewed as an expedient repair. Given that all that we've considered here, there are three things that still stand true. If you want to prolong the life of any steel hull, build it with good quality steel, as thick as the design would allow, fit anodes at the right scaling and composition, and use the best paint you can afford inside and out, and keep it painted, including the bottom plate. Not doing all three means thickness loss is inevitable. And in this video here, I found very thin steel on the keel of a 53-year-old motor cruiser caused by not looking after the steel well enough. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all next time.